bill payments, you know, land records, birth certificates and so on. All immediately online. You know, again, I was trying to keep trying to point out if it can be, if it's not used well, it can work both ways. E Chopal is an uh, initiative by the big tobacco company ITC, which also distributes food, so it's also in survey marketing. So when we studied that, you know, I did, had a, with my student, we did a research project jointly with the NIC, the National Informatics Center, a few years ago. And we looked at the use of these e, -E service, or rather these uh, e governance kiosks. And each of all was interesting. They use it to provide information on soybean interests. So the whole idea is that if we locate in places like Madhya Pradesh, where which is a big soybean growing center, in the villages we locate these electronic or the digital kiosks, the farmers can see the prices and be better informed. Okay, so that's a noble intent and the government supports that. But when we went in and looked at actually what happened, we found that for security reasons, the e Chopal site is located in the residence of the, of the elected representative to the village and he is usually of a high caste and he was not allowing the lower caste farmer to enter his house. So these are the, some of the issues that have to be looked at. The other thing which I won't spend time on this is that we found that informational services do not provide as high a return as transactional services. In other words, revealing prices is not as important as being able to actually do a transaction get a certificate, pay a tax, pay a utility bill and so on. And India actually is a test bed for the world for e-governance services. There's no other country in which so much experimentation has happened. And so these successes, you know, electronic voting for example, these are things you don't even see in developed countries. But India has established models that work. Finally, a little bit about, uh, you know, how democracy affects technology. I talked a bit about how technology affects democracy. But if you look at it the other way, you would, we can ask the question that does the Indian democracy system or the processes of democracy actually help the use of technology? So for the last few years I've been studying higher education in India and what I found or what our team found is that uh, there's very little technology used in higher education. Whether it's the joint entrance exam or the most sophisticated institutes in India, the IITs, or you look within the IITs or any other college, everything is paper-based. Okay, so if a student wants a transcript, he has to stand in line and go and then papers have to be signed and so on. Whereas, say, in any university in, of, even of small quality in the United States, you can always just download an unofficial transcript. So there's nothing, there's hardly any use of technology. This was a very interesting question. Why is it that when you have a government that is interested in technology, there's so much momentum behind it, why is it are the use of technology. This chart sort of tries to bring that out. It's, not, it's a bit cumbersome. But the key point is the, the involvement of the state, the state ministry of HRD on top, which through its membership of the Senate, you know, recruitment of vice chancellor, every year approving the budget, is, has become a deeply politicized system. So in order to protect patronage, you know, if you ask the governor or the, the chief minister of the state, would you rather spend money on technology or would you rather spend money on faculty development or would you rather open a new campus? They always open a new campus because that gives access, it gives patronage, it gives votes. So this is one of the failures of the system. Next one, please. You do see change, you know. Uh, here's an example of, uh, of a college in Hyderabad, in Jawaharlal Nehru Technology University where a company called Sierra Academy is implementing the virtual classroom. So you see all these screens. These students are doing a master's program in Hyderabad University, in JNTUH. And uh, there's no teacher in front. Actually, the teacher actually through the screen. And when I did, took this class, the teacher was in the United States teaching this class through web chat. Okay, and this is a semiconductor design class and program. Okay, another example of technology last year, BT Brinjal, uh, Brinjal India is the largest producer of Brinjal, Ekran, um, and the uh, Environment Minister Jairam Ramesh halted the production of, of, the, of the genetically modified seeds. This was a very interesting thing because it showed democracy at work. He went through hearings in seven states, evidence from scientists, and decided to halt the production. Again, democracy at work. In the cabinet, you had different loyalties. The industry minister and the agriculture minister closely allied with the business lobbies. Jairam Ramesh more interested in, the, in protecting the poor farmers. And 
so this battle took place. And of course, the latest news is that uh, both Pawar and Ramesh were dropped from the cabinet. I think Pawar for other reasons. But Ramesh was definitely linked to it. So you see, Plaza and my the democracy allows us to recognize both openly. We aren't afraid of saying that there are problems that need to be fixed. So just to wrap up, uh, you know, overall, technology has improved the, the quality of democracy in India. There's no doubt, I feel, that if you look at things like equity, justice, representation, and freedom, and I've tried to give you a sample of these, democracy has played a very, I mean, technology has played a powerful role. But on the other side, democratic processes make the adoption of technology sometimes more difficult. While misuse and repercussions from entrenched interests exist, the momentum for using more technology in governance comes from society at large. It's something that the people want, and therefore we like to Thanks very much.